Good morning and good afternoon to all of you for joining our live webinar today. Functional studies on membrane transporters using the Surfer N1 introduction and remote demonstration. My name is Jason Villagomez, marketing manager at Nanion Technologies, and will be your moderator for today's event. Joining us as speakers will be my colleagues, Dr. Maria Barthness, product manager of the Surfer product family, and Dr. Andre Bazon, application scientist for the Surfer products. Today's presentation is as follows. Maria will provide an introduction covering the basics and principles behind the technology at great depth. Additionally, she will look at practical topics like preparation of samples and experimental workflows. Finally, Andre will introduce some data sets to highlight the potential and possibilities for membrane transporter studies. As such, we have prepared a remote demonstration from our in-house lab and will provide live commentary. Upon completion of the presentation, upon completion of the presentation, we will hold the Q and A session, and as such, welcome you to ask a presenter's question at any time throughout the presentation. You can log a question via the chat window found on the right-hand side of your screen. If you happen to experience any technical difficulties at any time, please inform us via the chat box. Additionally, today's presentation will be made available on demand shortly upon completion of the event, inclusive of a transcribed copy of the Q&A. I will now turn over the presentation to Maria for the start of the talk. Um, thank you, Jason, and hello, everybody. So um, as Jason announced, I am going to begin this webinar with an in-depth introduction of the Surfer N1 technology and the method behind. So if you have questions during my presentation, just type them in the chat and at the end um, of the presentation and after the live demo, we will um, answer your questions. So just type anytime. So um, solid supported membrane based electrophysiology is the method behind the Surfer instruments. It was uh, invented in the 90s in Germany at the Max Planck Institute. And in 2006, the first commercially available setup um, was brought to the market. Um, after some uh, models and revisions, in 2014, Nanion provided the first um, Surfer N1, an up-to-date benchtop instrument, um, which we will talk about today. And um, since 2017, um, there is also a high throughput um, system available, uh, which is based on 96 well format and um, uses a robotic platform. So solid supported membrane based electrophysiology um, have a broad target range. So generally speaking, you can use it for any eukaryotic and prokaryotic membrane proteins which generate a charge translocation and respond to a chemical driving force. So more concrete, these are, for example, F-type and P-type ATPases, electrogenic co-transporters, uniporters if the substrate is charged, ligate-gated channels, but also electrogenic binding and translocation events. On the right side of my slide, you see um, all the known human membrane transport related proteins. And in red, I marked um, the groups which are suitable for surfer technology. So it's quite a lot of targets. Um, but the typical targets are transporters which generate very small membrane currents which cannot be resolved by other conventional electrophysiology methods. Um, the basis of the ability to resolve this small transmembrane currents is a special sensor technique, which I will explain now. So the sensors um, consist of a thin layer gold surface, which is coated with a so-called solid supported lipid membrane, in short SSM. So on the bottom right, you can see um, a sensor blank, um, which contains the gold surface. 
So on the upper left side, you see a cartoon view of this um, solid supported membrane setup. So it's layered from the gold, then we have a tile or octadecane tile layer, and on top a lipid monolayer. So these components are called solid supported membrane. Once the SSM is formed, um, a sample containing the transporter of um, interest is adsorbed to this SSM. So this can be either fragments of plasma membrane or liposomes containing the uh, transporter. Since the SSM is very stable, it's possible to use big surfaces, so typically three millimeters in diameter, meaning that the protein of thousands of cells is adsorbed to this sensor, which is the key behind this high resolution. So how does the readout work? Um, the SSM sensor behaves like a capacitor. So um, a capacitor is made up of two conductors which are enclosing a non-conductive region. And to recap, the mechanism of a capacitor is if charge um, is on one side of the conductor, it will induce um, opposite polarity charge on the other conductor side. So a membrane current in the component membrane, so in the membranes um, which are adsorbed to the SSM, this current will automatically induce a current on the gold surface um, of the same size and kinetics. So any membrane current in the transporter will be reflected on the gold surface. Um, to measure such a current signal, the protein activity on the sensor needs to be triggered somehow. So this is done by perfusion of the sensor. So on the left side, you can see some uh, pictures where the sensor is included into the surfer device. So the sensor with the SSM and the sample on top is put into a measurement chamber and then perfused with a special system which allows very fast um, and also continuous um, exchange of different buffers. So um, on the middle of my slide, you see a typical current signal and below the perfusion protocol applied um, to generate this signal. I will go through the different phases. So first we perfuse the sensor with um, a control buffer or non-activating non buffer, um, which does not contain anything that will um, activate the transport. So nothing happens and this is basically to generate a stable baseline. After that we switch um, to a substrate containing buffer and now the chemical gradient of the substrate will drive the transport. The transporter will be active and accumulate charge inside these vesicles on top of the SSM. And at the same time we see the current flow on the gold surface. Then we wash off the substrate again, and depending on the transporter, um, it might um, generate a second current flow in the other direction because the substrate is now within the vesicles and the driving force points into the other direction. Important to know is also that this activation can be repeated many times um, after a rinsing step. So, this part of the signal is what is actually interesting for us and which we will use for the analysis. So to recap, the perfusion triggers our transport activity. So here we can see again this middle part of the signal. We call it also the on signal. Um, so now we can look at the peak amplitude, for example, which reflects the transport rate or um, is proportional to the transport rate. We can also um, analyze the area under the curve, which reflects the total amount of charge which was transported. And then if you want to go really in depth, you can also um, fit the decay of the current to get time constants, for example, a decay time. Using this kind of activity measurement, you can perform a lot of different assay types. 
So, um, of course, it's possible to um, analyze uh, different substrates. So, um, what is nice is that you can compare the, um, not only the affinity, but also the turnover or the speed of transport for the different substrates. Then um, we can add compounds which um, have an inhibiting effect on the transporter and um, look at a signal um, decrease with the concentration of the inhibitor. This way it's also possible to find out if a substance is actually a substrate or an in, in, in inhibitor. Um, then it's also possible to look at the kinetics of the system, uh, of, the, of the transporter. So here you see an example where you see a slow um, reaction and something that looks much faster. So this is an example for binding versus transports events. So different events have very different kinetics which you can analyze. And finally, you are very free to change all the conditions. So you can change the pH, you can change the um, ionic composition of the buffers and this way find out a lot about the mechanism and the dependencies of the transporter. So we have a very broad assay range in mechanisms, but also in pharmacology. I already mentioned that you can use membrane or a liposomes, so I would go a little bit more in depth here. So um, typical sources that have been used for um, SSM-based electrophysiology are either eukaryotic cell lines, which are expressing um, the transporter, like HEC or CHO, but also bacterial expression is possible and even native tissues can be used. To generate a proper sample out of those um, sources, you can either um, purify the protein and reconstitute it in liposomes. This is something that results in very clean and high signals because nothing else should be in the liposomes. Or you can prepare the membrane by using centrifugation and a sucrose gradient. So then um, we have small vesicles or fragments of the plasma membrane. So this is typically how eukaryotic transporters would be measured. And finally, um, you can even um, purify organelles or organella membranes like mitochondrial membranes to look at um, this kind of transporters. Finally, um, it's important to know that the quality of the sample does matter a lot. So a high protein density will, of course, yield a high signal and low contamination um, as well. Actually, if you have a preparation with very high concentration, you only need very little of the preparation for the experiments because um, we need maximum 0.1 microgram protein per sensor. Of course, the amount of protein needed depends a lot on the turnover of the special target you want to look at. So we have a very high sample flexibility, but also the quality of the sample matters a lot for the success of the assay. Now, um, I would, look to, uh, would like to look a little bit about uh, in the workflow and the timeline. So how long does everything take? Um, the sample you prepare only once in a batch for a bunch of measurements. That might take a day, but um, for example, with one gram of um, CHO cells, you will get enough protein for 200 to 2,000 individual sensors. And the preparation is also very stable, usually for months or even years. At the day of the experiment, you have to code the sensor with the SSM. That happens by different pipetting steps and uh, takes about 90 minutes, including 60 minutes of incubation. We will show you these steps later also in live. So um, usually we prepare like 10 sensors for a day of measurements in the morning and then during the day you can do the measurements so each activation cycle takes about three to five minutes. So for example, if you have 10 sensors, you want to measure two IC50s with two compounds with six concentration. You want to do two replicates per concentrations. And um, yeah, you use five sensors for compound number one and five sensors for compound number two 
it will take about two hours for your data set. So far, um, a lot of targets have been measured with this technology. So most of them are actually uniporters, importers, or exchanges. Most of them importers actually. So here you can see a list um, sorted by the substrate which is transported. But there is also a bunch of pumps which have been measured and um, some channels. So most of this is actually published. So finally, I would like um, to show you a little case study to give you an impression of what the technology is capable of. I chose um, NCX, the sodium calcium exchanger, for this. So um, maybe you know that, but uh, um, NCX is uh, triggering an electrogenic exchange of sodium against calcium in a stoichiometry that yields a current flow. So it's expressed in cardiac and skeletal muscle, in brain, liver, and um, some other organs. And it's very important for the calcium homeostasis and also the regulation of excitability. So it's a very um, important uh, protein. Uh, it's also interesting for pharmacology, um, but um, also in physiological um, investigations, it's still um, interesting. So we started with uh, a hex cell line, which is expressing NCX1. And um, we prepared the membrane of those cells, um, applied it to the sensor, and then um, it was possible to activate NCX in two different ways. So we could either load the vesicles with sodium and then trigger um, the activity with calcium on the outside, or vice versa, we could load the vesicles with calcium and trigger with sodium. And you can see the signal is inverting. So the current flow is into uh, the other direction. We did some pharmacology to show this is really NCX current and there is no background. We get a 100% block with the compounds. And um, then we also transferred the whole assay to the HTS system. So it was also possible for screening compounds. Then uh, sometime later, we got the chance to characterize a prokaryotic NCX isoform. So this was NCX MJ from uh, Metanococcus yanashi. That is actually the NCX isoform which was used for crystallization. So a first um, structure of NCX was published and after that um, we could um, use this um, or look at the function of this protein. So what we did now is we used the protein, reconstituted it in liposomes, and then basically applied the same assay. So what we did here was um, an extensive substrate specification. So we tried all kinds of monovalent and divalent cations to see if calcium or um, sodium can be exchanged if the, if the protein is really specific for this. So here you can see, for example, that Strontium surprisingly generated very high currents. And then we also looked at the pharmacology, in particular at the um, behavior of uh, divalent ions, which have um, an inhibition or an inhibiting effect on most NCX. And we could show with these experiments that this prokaryotic NCX is actually behaving very similar to the eukaryotic NCX. Um, and then recently the question came up if this assay might also be suitable to analyze um, NCX in iPSC-derived cardiomyocytes. So those are model cells for uh, human cardiomyocytes. And um, we know basically that NCX is in those cells, but with patch clamp and calcium imaging it's very difficult to resolve this current because you have huge backgrounds and only with pharmacological blocking and subtraction of the current you get a small NCX activity. So we used um, the cardiomyocytes as they were, put them on the sensor and indeed could absorb surprisingly high um, NCX activity. So here in the middle, for example, you see a comparison of um, cardiomyocytes and hex cell assay 
and we get nearly half the amplitude. So that means we could use this assay to, again, characterize this cardio, um, cardial um, NCX uh, pharmacologically, but also um, defining affinities and so on. With that, um, I would like to conclude and summarize. So um, SSM-based electrophysiology, as it is implemented by the surface, um, is an electric readout method. It doesn't, read, uh, doesn't require any labels or probes. It's in real time. And um, it has a very high sensitivity due to the sensor area of three millimeter. We can record a lot of targets with that from Symporters exchanges to ATP ACES. You can um, look at all kinds of different um, characteristics, substrates, inhibitors, environment, kinetics, mechanism, and so on. Um, we can use all kinds of protein samples from bacteria or from cells and um, we have a very robust assay, which is stable over hours and allows us to do replicates on the same sensor. Now let's have a look at the instrument in the lab. We prepared a little sequence to show you the whole workflow, including the sensor preparation and the final results. So for this demo, we chose uh, to show you PEPT1, a proton-coupled oligopeptide transporter expressed in CHO membranes. So my colleague, Andre, will guide you through this now. My colleague, Maria, quickly headed to the lab. She will prepare 10 sensors for our PEPT1 assay we want to show you. Here, Maria opens a fresh pack of sensors. Sensors are packed in an argon-sealed packaging. There are 10 sensors in a tube. The active area of each sensor is centered at the bottom of the sensor and 3 mm in diameter. We usually collect the sensors in a petri dish because they fit so nicely. The first step in sensor preparation is adding 50 microliter of thiol solution. This assembles the first layer on top of the gold surface. The sensor becomes hydrophobic to be able to absorb the lipid monolayer later on. After 30 minutes incubation, the sensors are rinsed. First, with isopropanol to get rid of non-bound thiol. Then we wash off the solvent by rinsing with water. It's important to get the sensor surface completely dry here. The thiol layer is very hydrophobic. That's why there are no water droplets remaining after shaking off the water. After this step, the sensor surface looks very shiny. Now we add 1.5 microliter of the lipid solution to form the solid supported membrane. We carefully form a drop on the pipette tip and place it on the gold area of the sensor. Directly after adding the lipid, we add the non-activating solution. The SSM then forms spontaneously. The composition of the non-activating buffer used here depends on the transporter assay. In this case, it's a hepas mis combination at pH 6.7. This is the pH optimum for PEPT1. After adding the non-activating solution, the sensor is ready to absorb the PEPT1 sample. We usually store 10 microliter aliquots for our membrane samples at minus 80 degree. They will last for years. 
In this case, we recombinantly express PEPT1 in CHO cells and purified membrane vesicles from the plasma membrane fraction. Ten microliter is sufficient for ten sensors and even more. In this case, we dilute the sample one to ten with non-activating buffer to get one hundred microliter of diluted sample. The sample needs to be sonicated using a tip sonicator to get a homogeneous suspension. This is to break membrane clusters which appear when the samples are frozen. We are using 10 bursts in 1 second intervals. Without sonication, the sample won't absorb nicely to the sensors. After sonication, the sample is ready to be added to the sensors. We add 10 microliter of the sample to each sensor by submerging the pipette tip into the solution and slowly releasing the sample on the sensor surface. Before use, the sensors are centrifuged for 30 minutes at 2000 G. This enhances the stability of the sensors. After centrifugation, the sensors are ready to use. Now Maria switched to our server lab area. The server has a built-in computer with Windows 10. After login, she is starting the server data recording and analysis software. There is a quick hardware initialization step at software start and you can select the directories for the data. The first thing to do is initializing the liquid handling components. This is done by selecting initialize daily from the workflow drop down menu. Then the liquid handling components are rinsed and filled with water. This is important for accurate pipetting during the measurements. The whole procedure takes about two minutes to complete. You can observe the syringe pumps on the instrument's front pumping water from the water container. Within the software, there is a session log window at the bottom right showing when a workflow is finished. During initialization, Maria provides the measurement solutions to the instrument. Here, Maria is adding the non-activating solution into the right reservoir of the surfer. Then we have prepared three different activating solutions containing different substrate concentrations. Maria is adding those to three different autosampler wires. The activating solution with the highest concentration is inserted at position 1 of the autosampler. And the lower concentrated activating solutions follow at positions 2 and 3. Now Maria is adding the sensor to the measurement chamber. On the bottom of the chamber you see a small contact pin which needs to touch the contact pad of the sensor. The sensor is fixed with this lever and the measurement chamber is closed with a lid to form a Faraday cage. Now we are back with the software and need to select a measurement workflow. There are a few preset workflows you can choose from. But any workflow can be adjusted manually and workflows also can be built from scratch. Here we select our standard workflow number 6. It opens in the workflow editor on the left. Let's adjust the workflow for our experiment. 
The positions of the solutions are already fine. Activating buffer, here labeled as buffer A, is at position 1 of the auto sampler, and non activating buffer B is located in the right reservoir. The actual measurement workflow lies within a loop to be able to easily define the number of measurements. The outer loop is set to 3, since we have three different activating solutions. The inner loop is set to 2, since we want to perform duplicate measurements with each set of solution. We also need to measure capacitance and conductance of the sensor before the actual measurement. They can be added via drag and drop from the functions window. These parameters are indicators for sensor quality and need to be within a typical range. We can even add a message prompt function to ask us if the quality parameters are fine before the workflow proceeds with the actual measurement. At the end, we save the workflow for future use. Now we can execute it and start the measurement. On the bottom right, you can observe the workflow status and follow the whole sequence. Now capacitance and conductance are measured by applying voltage. The calculated values for cup and con are displayed in the results sheet. 30 nanofarad and 1.5 nanosiemens are very good parameters so we can continue with the measurement by confirming that the sensor parameters are fine. The measurement starts with the pipeter moving to the right reservoir to take up non-activating solution into the blue labeled tube. Then it moves to auto sampler position 1 to take up the activating solution with a higher substrate concentration into the red labeled tube. Now we want to start injection of solutions to the sensor with non-activating solution, but the tip of the pipeter contains activating solution. That is why we need to dispense non-activating solution into the wash station before starting the actual measurement. Finally, the pipetter moves to the measurement chamber and injects the solutions. The recorded trace appears within the graph window. Let's have a closer look here. Injection of non-activating solution starts at 0.3 seconds of the time axis. There are a few peaks, mechanical artifacts, but the baseline current is achieved shortly after. After the time point of 1 second, the internal valve switches to inject activating solution, which arrives at the sensor about 80 milliseconds afterwards. At this time point, we measure proton translocation by PEPT1 induced by 20 millimolar glycyl glycine. The current decay is fast due to the rise of membrane potential. At the time point of 2 seconds, the valve switches again to inject non-activating solution and wash off the substrate. The off-peak is recorded reflecting efflux of protons and peptides through PEPT1. The recorded trace is also locked into the results sheet. Peak currents and integrals are shown. And we can comment experimental conditions. We usually write down all important workflow and buffer conditions, but here Maria is logging the substrate concentrations only as an example. By the way, this video recording is in real time since the start of the experiment. One single measurement takes about three minutes. The instrument now finishes its initialization procedure before continuing with the second measurement. It also cleans the liquid handling components. Now the second measurement begins. We switch to another angle to better observe the actions of the pipetter. 
By the way, the name of the pipetter is ion jet. The ion jet takes up non-activating solution here. Then the ion jet moves to the activating solution. It dispenses non-activating solution into the wash station. And the measurement begins. The yellow label tube removes solution from the sensor well to achieve a continuous flow of solutions through the sensor. After the measurement, there is an additional rinse step with non-activating solution to get rid of remaining substrate within the sensor. The ion jet takes up non-activating solution for the additional rinse step here. Let's compare the first with the second measurement. We can open the file explorer within the software and overlay the two traces. We zoom in to better see the on peak. Now you can see the first trace in black and the second trace in blue. Both overlay quite nicely. Finally, we can add the experimental conditions to the result sheet again. The instrument still performs the initialization. We made a cut here and go directly to the third measurement. During the third measurement, we use the activating solution in auto sampler position 2, containing a lower substrate concentration. That's why before taking up activating solution, the black auto sampler wheel spins. From this perspective, you can also observe the electrode pin used for the grounding within the measurement chamber. Since the instrument works fully automated, this is the time for a break. Let's have a coffee. Or call it a day and get back on the next day for data analysis. Whenever you come back on another day to look at the data, you first have to start the software. You open the file explorer to see the recorded traces. And you can open the respective results sheet to figure out the experimental conditions for each recorded trace. Here, number 17 is the trace with the lowest substrate concentration. Select the trace you want to look at and zoom in to see the on peak. With this lock button, we can fix this view. By the way, we usually filter the raw data with 100 Hz. This is how the raw data really looks like. Now we can overlay all the traces by selecting them in the file explorer and holding control. As a reminder, we used three different substrate concentrations 
and measured each in duplicates. For data analysis, we can directly copy and paste peak currents or integrals from the results sheet into any analyzer software. Or we can easily export the recorded traces into ASCII format, which can be imported to any software. And this is how the Michaelis Menten plot looks like to determine a KM value from our dataset. This is it. We went through the whole procedure from sensor preparation to data analysis. Now I'm handing over back to Jason for the Q&A session. Thank you, Andre. So I will now moderate some of the questions that we've received and I will let Maria and Andre comment. So the initial question, how do you distinguish between an inhibitor and a substrate based on inhibition experiments? So um, to distinguish between an inhibitor and a substrate, it makes sense to have two different uh, kind of experiments. So um, you can do first um, a measurement where you just add the compound as an activation um, solution. So just like Andrea showed in the peptide measurement, so instead of the glycine, you would just add this um, compound in question. And then afterwards, you would mix the compound together with um, a known substrate and see if the amplitude decreases. So these would be two different runs. And then a follow-up question, is it possible to test the voltage? So the system itself has no voltage control. So because actually the change of voltage is our readout. So we cannot um, apply a voltage during the measurement um, through the amplifier. So that means um, we always start at zero membrane potential and then watch um, the building up of the membrane potential. Um, however, it is possible to apply membrane voltages um, with ionophores, for example, um, if you want to have um, like a basic uh, potential as a driving force. So there are some workarounds. However, it's not a voltage clamp system. So um, you cannot apply voltage jumps as you would do in patch clamp. And then a secondary question. What was the activation solution for cardiomyocytes? How were all other transporters excluded from the assay? So um, the, the buffers used for the cardiomyocyte um, experiments were very basic. So they basically only contained um, sodium for the internal buffer and um, uh, sorbitol or potassium for the um, external buffers. And that is actually also the reason why so little um, other activities are observed. So with this specific activation cycle that we apply for the NCX measurement, um, nothing else um, became active. So um, it's because we don't have the membrane potential, because we don't have any other um, cofactors um, or ions that might be necessary for other transporters or channels um, to be active. So um, it might happen that in some assays, um, other um, transporters or channels in the background um, show also activity, but that happens actually very rarely because most assays are specific in their activation cycle. Um, and we proved that um, with um, yeah, inhibition experiments, for example, with CIA 0400, which is one of the more specific NCX blockers, we could show that there is actually no active background in our um, assay, which was very nice. Can you use intact cells and measured transport? So generally, yes, you can. Um, so far, we um, have used hex cells and CHO cells 
and the cardiomyocytes Maria presented, um, but we um, usually recommend to use plasma membranes since the signal to noise is better and assay development is um, much more easier. And then what kind of cells have you used so far? So as I just mentioned, um, we used uh, CHO cells and HEX cells um, as uh, standard expression systems. Um, so we also used the cells uh, directly on the sensors and it worked out. Um, but signal to noise was lower and we also used the cardiomyocytes. Maria presented. Is it possible to add solutions to the external solution manually? And then a second question, can measurements be done automatically with multiple sensors on the surfer? How will, does the membrane system of the sensor behave over time? Um, adding manually um, will not work. Um, it's because, uh, yeah, the or maybe it will give you some kind of signal, but the quality of the perfusion, the speed of the perfusion, and also the volume added is um, crucial for um, the activity. And also that you um, add the buffer in a continuous speed without um, any changes which you would have if you pipe at something that would actually change the shape of the signal. So this is not possible. And then um, second part was if you can use, um, yeah, um, you have to exchange the sensors manually in the N1 system after each experiment. So what you can do automatically is doing the sequence on the whole, um, uh, on, on one sensor. So you can do up to 30, 50 measurements um, in sequence automatically, but then somebody has to um, exchange the sensor for the next um, cycle. So what you, yeah, this is why we have the automated system, the 96 SE, which is for um, higher throughput. Can pH be used for activation? And if so, is it tricky? pH can be used, but um, the outcome will highly depend um, on the pH gradient you need um, or the pH jump you need for activation. If um, the change of pH for activation is quite high, then you will also trigger some uh, solution exchange artifacts because um, protons um, interact with the membrane itself. Um, so um, if you do so, we highly recommend to use a negative control membrane without um, the protein of interest to figure out and to which extent the signal is influenced by some artifacts. Can the instrument be used to measure binding of a charged ligand to membrane protein without transmembrane transport? Um, yes, it can, but um, the prerequisite of that is that the um, binding event needs to be electrogenic, meaning the ligand needs to trigger something within the protein which can be measured, like um, an electrogenic conformational transition or maybe an internal um, translocation of a charged um, ligand. Can the sensor be cleaned and reused? Yes, it can. So um, we usually say uh, five to 10 times, depending on how you treat the sensors. So at some point, um, the gold will scratch and um, sensor will wear off. But um, if you treat them well, um, you can clean them and reuse them um, for several times. How is the capacitance at the beginning measured without voltage step? Um, of course, it was measured with a voltage step. So um, 
in, for capacity and conductance measurements, we apply certain voltage protocols. Um, so, and then we have the, the current readout to determine um, the values. However, we cannot do this during an actual measurement because, um, for example, in the um, conductance measurement, maybe you remember how the current shape looked. We had this huge um, upstroke and then slowly getting back to um, a certain value. So that means if we would do a voltage jump during a measurement, the same would happen. So it's um, extremely difficult to hold it on a certain voltage. So technically it would be possible to apply voltage, but um, it's not easy or it's, it's basically not possible to um, fix this um, voltage on a certain value. So even transport activity would then again influence voltage and so on. So it's it's tricky to do that. Um, of course, we thought about that and maybe at some point there will be a technical solution. But um, so far, it's not possible to apply voltage step during a measurement. And then as a final question, uh, and again, I, I want to remind that any unanswered questions we will transcribe and make available with the on-demand copy of this webcast. Uh, but back to the question, can you change the internal solution of proteoliposomes on the fly, or do you need to prepare sensors with a variety of different internal solutions? So this highly depends how tight the proteoliposomal membrane is for the respective compound you want to get a gradient for. Um, for example, if you want to get pH gradients, this is uh, quite nicely doable because um, protons go through membranes um, on a minute time scale, so you can establish gradients on the fly easily. Um, but if you have like um, other ligands or um, larger molecules which go, won't go through the membrane, you need to prepare different sensors um, to adjust the internal composition of the proteoliposomes. We would like to thank you for attending today's webcast. We will make immediately available upon completion of the event an on-demand copy of both the video and the questions asked. Naturally, if you have any additional questions, please don't hesitate to contact us one-to-one, -one, and we're happy to assist in any upcoming experiments that you might have. We wish you a good rest of your day.